All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the actual first review episode of Rusty Collins, a recap and review. I know you guys have seen now two pull lists and an introduction video, but this is the first actual episode of what I'm going to be bringing to you on a regular basis. So without any further ado, let's get straight into the comics that I bought on January 3rd, 2018, but we're going to cover today. All right. So the first comic we got here is from Marvel, Astonishing X-Men, number seven, by Charles Soule and Phil Noto. All right, so this comic, I really enjoyed. This has been one of those, either you love it or you hate it. Um, not a lot of people who are just kind of in between on it. I really appreciate this comic. I know the storyline so far has kind of been the same storyline we've seen a lot of times in the past as far as Shadow King versus Xavier and that just back and forth over and over. What this comic stands out from the rest of the X-Men titles for me is it's got that vibe and essence that just kind of dark edginess that the X-Men were really known for primarily a long time ago from when I read in the like 80s and 90s here. So I'm really appreciating that. And this issue, the end of last issue we had Phantom X sacrifices basically psychic essence to stay in the astral plane so Xavier could come out in his body. So now you have Xavier in Phantom X's body. And this issue cracked me up because Xavier shows up and he's like, hey guys, don't worry, I'm Xavier. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go around like Oprah and be like a gift for you and a gift for you and a gift for you and gifts for everybody. Like... They handled it better than that, but that was the how I kind of cracked up in my mind. Uh, first things first, he went to Archangel, and Archangel's been a rage demon. He's been, just been angry and can't really control the Archangel. He can either be Warren, or he can be a mindless monster. There's no in-between. He can't use the power of Archangel and control it, and Xavier fixed him right on the spot. Uh, there's a really cool moment where he re immediately regains control of the Archangel, and then just like stops a, a missile, like dead stops a missile, because the Loveland government, London government, decides the best way to finish this situation is just to nuke everybody. Comic books, because that would not happen in real life. So, he gives them first gift, here's Archangel. Second gift ends the psychic plague of people that the, uh, the Shadow King has unleashed. The third gift is he makes it so M6 doesn't remember a single thing. It just didn't happen. And then the last gift he gives everybody is uh, bringing everybody kind of back together. It was really funny. He just goes around doing this to everybody. And then the last reveal in the end of the issue, after they kind of get everything buttoned up and taken care of and shut down, is uh, Proteus is back. Proteus is a villain back in the 70s that made the psycho battled berserker rage wolverine shake to his knees just like wolverine was horrified of that villain nothing had rocked him like that until that point so i'm really excited to see where they're going to go with proteus now in this list of characters where you got gambit who never faced proteus but then wolverine did old man logan so that's going to be awesome coming up i can't wait to see that but uh, yeah, overall on this issue, Xavier's back in Phantom X's body, the Shadow King got stopped, everybody got saved, Archangel can be Archangel again, and Proteus, this is bad, Proteus. So, I'm excited to see where this one goes. Next issue coming up is, alright, next we have Captain America 697. Awesome cover art there, Raven the Hunter. This is written by Mark Wade, Chris Samneen, and the color artist is Matthew Wilson. So, this issue also, pretty interesting. Captain America is just doing what he does, and he gets duped by this chick, and he gets drugged, and wakes up in his Captain America outfit, which I thought was really weird that he didn't have it on, but they woke up with it on comic books. But anyways, he wakes up and he's a prisoner of Craven the Hunter. And Craven the Hunter is like, I hunt the best hunts on the planet. And you're the best soldier, so I'm gonna hunt you. And Captain America's like, you can't make me play your game, dude. It doesn't work that way. 
And Craven's like, oh, okay, well, then I'll just kill this innocent guy. And it shows a dude running from a leopard. And Captain America does what Captain America does. He runs out and he saves the guy. And the guy's like, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know who I am. I don't know what's going on. I just want to live. And Captain America realizes all of a sudden he has to get this guy from pretty much from point A to point B. And he has to keep this dude alive. And he saves him from this leopard. And they go on this adventure through the jungle. And this guy literally does, like, everything wrong. You know, don't do this. And he does that. Grabs onto everything that could possibly turn into a booby trap. And just, like, slows Cap down. It really drags out the thing. And then at the end you realize that this guy is going to kill Cap. And he whips a gun out when he thinks Cap's not looking. And Cap chumps him. Like, I smelled the gunpowder on you a long time ago. I know what you're doing. I was just playing along. You're the trap, not the traps. And Craven shows up like, oh, well played, blah, blah, blah. And they go to have their showdown, and they fight. And they both tumble off a cliff. And that's when, you know, you're kind of reading this, and you're like, all right, well, this is really standard. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the, the group of guys who attacked Captain America and got started off this whole Home of the Brave story arc show up again on a boat with the freeze ray, and because they tumbled off a cliff and Cap's in the water, they freeze Cap in a solid block of ice. And he gets all PTSD when he's doing He's like, no, no! This, is, this has happened before. And, um, yeah, so Craven just f played with him and toyed with him the whole issue so these other guys could freeze him in ice and kidnap him. Cool issue. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it. It was a really fun twist scene that he thought he was saving this innocent guy, and the innocent guy was in on it the whole time. But then I remembered, so if he'd have been a split second slower and had not saved this guy from that, like, leopard in the very beginning, the whole issue was blown. If that guy would have gotten killed right there, Craven's entire plan would have never worked. Good thing it did. So... I don't have a problem with this. I love this comic. Captain America is my favorite superhero of all time. Uh, I like that they're kind of keeping it grassroots, homegrown. They're keeping it very low-key. Uh, I don't have a problem that he's trying to figure out what to do now after that whole Secret Empire thing. So, excited to see what happens with Cap coming up. Like I said, we're at issue 697. We're going to have an issue 700 coming up very soon. So... Lord knows what they're going to do with that. Now, in this issue, there's also a Where is Wolverine? Because Wolverine has been resurrected, but nobody really knows what's going on with him. So they decided to handle Wolverine by, like, one-page layouts in the back of each of these comics. And literally, literally, all Wolverine does is he goes into the bar that Captain America's kidnapped from and is like, is this guy here? And the bartender's like, nope. Mm-hmm. And that's it. So that was pretty strange. Anyways, next comic. Alright. Guardians of the Galaxy, issue 150. Again with that super nifty lenticular cover. Those are always fun. Although, the back, you can't really see it on here, but the back looks better than the front. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how Marvel keeps doing that, where the backs are better than the fronts. But anyways, moving on. So this issue here is written by Jerry Dugan, and the art is by Aaron Cunder and Marcus Two. Oh man. So this is the last issue of Guardians of the Galaxy. I have not been reading this run of Guardians of the Galaxy prior to this issue. I literally bought this issue because they're Eternal Warlock. Because they're doing a big thing with the Infinity Gauntlet, because there's an Infinity movie coming, so why not have comics that reflect the movies at the same time, and... Sure. So that's what they're doing here. Um, the actual Guardians are all, like, disbanding. They're breaking up. They're leaving each other. This issue is particularly strange, because you get to see Rocket Raccoon with a Nova Core mask and powers, like, fighting. Yeah, like I said, it ends the, the storyline for the Guardians of the Galaxy. I was interested in this for Adam Warlock, and pretty much the return of Adam Warlock, that's what happens in this issue. Um, 
nothing really grand or spectacular. It's kind of kind of lackluster. I felt to have him wandering around the Souls Gem. He encounters an angry Gamora who feels she's lost in the Soul Gem, and she's very angry that she can't get out. And then he awakes in the very end of the issue with none other than Kang the Conqueror, and he's alive. He's back. They really didn't go into a lot of detail on who, what, when, where, why. I mean, it was it was pretty short, sweet, wrapped around the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy candy-coated shell. So this now turns into Adam and the Infinity Watch or something again. And I'll buy issue one of that, and we'll see where it goes. Again, I don't really want to say a lot of bad things, so we'll just go with what was good, and we'll move on to the next comic. All right. Last issue from Marvel Comics tonight. We've got Star Wars issue 41. This is written by Karen Gillen, uh, Salvador La Rocha, and Guru Efex. Uh, I'm really enjoying this comic. The, the Star Wars line and the Darth Vader comic that came out almost three years ago were what brought me back into comic books. Um, until then, I was just reading all my dad's comics and just kind of living... 20 years ago in the past or more 72 to 94 is what's behind me and uh, I, was, I didn't buy any comics I didn't care it was all weird and then the Star Wars comics came out and I was like oh man a Darth Vader comic and a Star Wars comic like you got me let's go so this one's been top notch uh, the writer now Karen Gillen used to write the Darth Vader comics so they're they're kind of intermingling they're bringing a lot of elements from the Vader comic to here one of those is the land barons these people just mine ore and they have ore strippers the size of cities that just mine constantly and the damn thing's literally huge size of the city and they're trying to mine the these minerals off this planet meanwhile Luke and Leia and Han and the the rebellion are trying to work with this other faction who's not part of the rebellion but they want them to be like hey if we help you do some crap here you can help us down the road later right and these guys are actually linked to uh, Zog Saw Guerrera from Rogue One so they're really bringing a lot of elements to, to tie this together to make it a cohesive universe and I'm loving that especially as they scrap the old book universe which I was a very large fan of so this is a nice replacement for that those of you who are salty as I was, am. Just saying. So, Luke is on this planet, obviously, because he wants to be a Jedi. That's why Luke's here. So he finds this place, and there's these, these local fates, and another local man who's pilgriming with him to the site of power in this temple. And then they get there, and the, the fates are kind of cryptic and real ooh, spooky, like all these kind of things are. And they start meditating, and this other pilgrim attacks Luke in the middle of meditation. And Luke has to kill the guy. Like, just <laughs> kill the guy. And he's like, what the heck? And the fates are like, you learned your lesson? And Luke's like, yeah, this place is evil. The dark side sucks. And they're like, yep. That was, that's literally the lesson. And Luke's like, that, that seems silly, but okay. And they're like, no, you've seen the temptation of the dark side, and you walked away from it. That that was the lesson this site held, and your buddy failed, and you passed. And it was it was kind of low key for as much as they built it up, but it worked for Luke's power level here. Because mind you, we still haven't even seen the Battle of Hoth in storyline wise. Like this is still after the blow the Death Star, and they don't even have Hoth yet. So it made sense for where they are. Meanwhile, the rebels are trying to fight this city or stripper, not having any luck. And Chewbacca is in a ship in space trying to smuggle in a single item. And Chewbacca gets past the Imperials, hurts himself physically very bad in the process, and the issue ends on the weirdest cliffhanger. Like, there's a page missing almost, I swear. I don't think there is but it could be, where it's just like Hans berating Leia, like, this better be worth it. Leia's like, it will be. This just like tiny, tiny panel in the bottom corner, and she's just holding like a computer chip, and then it just ends. So the ending was very abrupt. Like, like they were trying to smash a lot of content into this, and just were like, oh crap, we don't have room to do a big pretty splash page at the end. I mean, it didn't hurt the quality of the comic, it was just 
super abrupt. So, either way, uh, I think next issue we will finally resolve this first story arc. And, yeah. I can't say enough good things about this comic. It's been flipping awesome. Alright. Up next we've got The Jetsons. DC Hanna-Barbera offshoots, issue number three of six. These have been great. Pretty much anything with the Hanna-Barbera has been worth reading to outstanding. It's been very good. So, this is written by Jimmy Palmiotti, and the artist is Pierre Brito. Basic concept of this, uh, global warming happened, elevation of the ocean riz, or er, oceans rose. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oceans rose, and there, there's like no land to live on anymore. So they live in floating, elevated platform cities, much as we've seen in the cartoon. Um, George is one of the most prolific uh, mechanics of his, his path. He, he's the guy who's known to be able to figure anything out, take care of anything, get on it, get it done. His wife is a high-level scientist who's been asked to come together to work on a project because there is an asteroid at the same time coming straight at the Earth to smash into it, similar to the dinosaurs. Now, last issue, a bunch of the floating platforms went out and Elroy the Sun was on one of them and had, had a moment with his girlfriend where things almost got out of control and people died. So, Jane is coming back to the planet from being on the International Space Station, where she was with this group of scientists to figure out what are they going to do about this asteroid coming. Well, lo and behold, it's simultaneously at the exact same time, due to Elroy screwing around when he shouldn't have been in the ocean, this giant, crazy cosmic alien basically burst out of an egg at the bottom of the ocean. And is causing like distress waves and gravi gravity anomalies, and that was what's screwing with the floating cities. So Jane comes back, everybody reunites, it's all happy. They go on the mission. They, they rig it up where George and Jane get to go together, because they're both at the top of their field, so they both got selected to go on this as, as a husband and wife, and it was kind of a cute moment. And they go on this mission, and they get underwater, and the alien that's down there grabs their little tiny submersible and starts to crush it just like smash on it alive this is a huge alien a little tiny ship and he's just crushing on it and george being the mechanic figures out a way to backlog the energy and, and basically electrocute this creature well right before he does that he has like a psychic encounter with the alien he doesn't really understand what happens but he gets he gets laid out and, and blacks out, but gets this reaction to happen, and they get free. So everybody gets free, they get home, the scientists are kind of processing what happened, and George starts displaying psychic abilities. But George is kind of a nincompoop, so he doesn't really catch on to the fact that he can read people's... He can do it, but he doesn't notice it. He's just like, oh, wow. And end of the issue there everybody started to kind of put it together like what's different with george so now you've got george jetson with psychic powers giant i mean giant alien at the bottom of the ocean and an asteroid all coming together in one furious climactic um three more issues so we'll see where all this goes it's been amazing so far really enjoyed it the art in this has been not the best, but for the comic, holy crud, does it work right. So, next we've got another Hanna-Barbera, Snagglepuss, exit stage left. This is issue one, so I know as much as you know, pretty much at the end of this. Uh, this starts off really bizarre. It starts off with Snagglepuss and his wife, because I was under the impression he was gay, go to his debut of a Broadway play where everybody is lavishing him and telling him how great he is and how wonderful it is and you see parts of this play and it's dark and emotional and oh my golly and then they they leave and they take the wife home and she's an actress just playing along 
he goes to a gay bar and finds his lover. And they start having a conversation about rights and freedoms, because mind you, this is the 50s, and the, the lover's from Cuba, Cuba, and he's talking about the, the persecution they had to deal with there, and it's got a backdrop of the, the communist fear, the, the red kind of uh, craze that everybody was going through at the time. And there's an American couple that, that like, newscasts in the background, newspapers in the background, you know, all, all these, like, subliminal, not directly, but, but kind of there, or one or two panels off to the side. There's an American couple being brought up on treason and espionage charges, and they're going to be put to death. And they swear they're innocent, but they're found guilty of being communists. And meanwhile, Snagglepuss is talking to people in his personal life, and they're, they're kind of hinting at him that, you know, he needs to be careful because he could fall from grace, and he's not really catching what they're hinting at. And then in the very end of the book, they're like, the, there's congressmen talking about how they want to bring him on the stand, and how they brought him on the stand before it, it didn't end well, which is a one-shot that started this whole thing. And they're like, yeah, but we have something now we didn't have. And it shows him in, like, a trench coat and a hat looking all, like, spooky. So they're trying to insinuate he's a, a communist or a terrorist at the same time. So really kind of bizarre. Um, I was excited for this, but I don't know what I was expecting. My expectations are not hurt. It's just not what I was expecting. So I'm, I'm interested to see where the next few issues go. Um, like I said, all the Hanna-Barbera stuff has come out just fine. There there really hasn't been glaring problems with any of them. They've all been either entertaining to amazing. So I've got a lot more faith in this than I do some of the other things being printed right now. And we'll see what's going on and a couple more issues with that. All right, next we have Bombshells United, number nine. This is by Marguerite Bennett. And, um, fail... Saya Oum. Alright, so the bombshells, the entire concept of this is an alternate reality, essentially. It's another one of the, the I don't even know if it's a multiverse world, but it's just another, a whole different thing. Um, pretty much all the superheroes are women. Pretty much everybody's gay. And it happens in World War II. The uh, original story arc for this was, was Pinup Girls. Nazi zombies, World War II, like, you, you can't go wrong. It's not as strong now as it was when it started, but it's still really good. I'm enjoying the crap out of it. I know a lot of people are kind of give or take. A lot of people don't like it. Whatever. I find it amazing. It's, it's one of my favorite comics. It's gorgeous, and this issue revolves around my favorite, which is Batwoman. So this issue, Black Adam and the Shazam or Black Adam, for sure, is is there in Spain. And Batwoman, Renee Montoya, have, are working together because they have history with the Spanish Revolution a few years prior. And they're there trying to figure out what Black Adam is, which it's pretty funny, Renee Montoya and Batwoman against Black Adam. Like, they're phenomenally outclassed, but irrelevant. They're going to go into it. They don't care. So they're, they're going about this, and you get a nice origin of Black Adam going back thousands of years to why he went from, you know, being granted the power of Shazam, one of these noble, priest, you know, ethic, nice, good guys, to a, a corrupt, hateful man. And uh, the woman he loved was killed, and by golly, until he got her back, nah, he's gonna burn the world. So he's been working for thousands of years to find the Lazarus Pit to bring this woman back to life. And while he's looking for the Lazarus Pit, Cheetah shows back up, who is an, a, another character that has, has been a pretty shitty uh, villain in this. And it's one of her ways of redemption, because she... Backstory. So Renee Montoya and Batwoman were a thing. And they had, like, a couple. And they adopted a little boy named... Jason, and then Jason was killed on them. Their little Robin. And it pushed along the storyline, and you were kind of like, okay, that was cute, whatever. Was Cheetah put that little boy, because Cheetah was the one who killed him, in the dang Lazarus pit? 
So now you've got basically essentially a, a seven-year-old Red Hood who isn't Jason Todd, but it's Jason Todd uh, brought into this universe just because you can. That's kind of how bombshells work. You're going to see characters that exist, but that's not how they work just because you can, and it's fun, and stop complaining and just enjoy it, and that's the point. So they get their Jason back, and everybody's all happy, but there's still this Black Adam problem that they've they've got to address and take care of, and um, yeah, there wasn't really a lot of action, not really a lot of fighting in this issue, just story, just kind of pushing the storyline. Um, like I said, I can see why a lot of people really don't like this comic. It, if you're anti-social justice warrior or or that, this comic's probably gonna piss you off. If you're, you know, open to a lot of weird, crazy, and wild stuff, this comic's great. And like I said, all super shows are done in the fashion of pit-up models, so it's 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 a weird, quirky, awesome, amazing book. So. Bombshells United number nine. Yeah. All right. Next we have Batman thirty eight by Tom King and Travis Moore. Batman uh, under Tom King has been incredible through and through. Um, something about how Tom King writes and these darker characters just they play very well off each other. So this issue claims the origin of Bruce Wayne, which people who don't even know Batman know the origin of Bruce Wayne. Like, we know what's going on. But it starts with um, a child stumbling across his parents dead. And the serial killer, Zaz, is the one who did it. But Zaz is in jail. So Batman goes into the detective thing, like, well, how could this be? Another group of people get murdered. And Batman's like, okay... This is all connected and linked, but this wasn't Zaz, this was Two-Face, so they're working together. And he starts to realize they're copycats. This isn't the real Zaz's work, this isn't the real Two-Face's work. There, There's things in them that are they're copycats. And he's going through this whole thing, and meanwhile, the, the child from the original you know, Zaz murders, that kid who found them, that kid's creepy, like... Bruce Wayne proper goes to meet him, and the kid swears he's Bruce Wayne to Bruce Wayne. Like, hi, Bruce Wayne. I'm Bruce Wayne. Has the butler, a different butler, not Alfred, he's just a butler, call him Master Bruce. And, my parents are dead. Do you know what that's like? Of course you know what that's like. And this kid's just nuts. So, like, he's totally bizarre and bonkers. And Bruce Wayne's like, I'm going to help you. You know, I know what you're going through. He's, he's that over-compassionate guy that Bruce Wayne... Bruce Wayne, not, not Batman. Bruce Wayne can be with a child. You know, kind of that, like, Robin-esque, you know, little boy hurt. Oh! So you're watching, you're reading, and, um, it's going on and on, and he's like, this can't be Bat, you know, two faces can't be. Zaz, like, what is this? And he goes to the... The butler, the guy, the kid's proprietor, basically, and he's like, I know it's you. It starts like threatening him and giving him the shakedown, and he's like, you did this. You did all this, but why? And the guy's like, the money, Batman. <laughs> Sorry. And um, Batman's like, oh, crap, you know, you did this to steal, you know, the money from the kid. And he's like, that doesn't make any sense either. When you could have just stole the dang money from the kid, and everything about this was so ch childish and it hits Batman and that's when this comic took a left turn and it spooked me a little bit because Batman goes back to the kid this kid like literally like a, a, like eight nine year old kid and he goes to this kid and this kid is carved in his face Martha and Thomas and is like I'm Bruce Wayne and is like killing people and Batman's like, oh my lord, it wasn't the Guardian. This kid's been doing the murders, and this kid's gonna go to jail, and this kid's flipping insane. And that screwed with my head. But then at the same time, I had to ask myself one question. I'm like, hold on, stop, 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 rewind. How the Piplum did that kid 
know the M.O.s of these, like, psycho supervillains. Had the kid... Well, that seemed that seemed like the only part of this that was at all even minorly far-fetched was this kid, and he, even with the help of his guardian, were able to put together, like, Zaz's M.O. perfectly with this other letter to tie it all together and then trick it into thinking it was Two-Face and then, you know, all these layers to keep Batman, like, on his toes for quite a while to turn out to just be this child. So don't get me wrong, it was dark and, and spooky and I liked the story. But that was a really big question at the end, like, how did he know all that crud? So... Anyways, Batman is an amazing comic. If if you only have money to buy a handful of comics a month, it ships twice a month, this is probably one of the ones you should be buying. This comic is amazing. Alright, next comic is also a Batman comic, but it's Batman White Knight. This is another one of those like offshoot, different realities, not the core world books, done by Sean Murphy and Matt Hollinsworth. So I'm enjoying the crap out of this comic. Uh, the basic idea is Batman has overstepped what he should be doing as a vigilante. And the Joker got cured. Uh, his, his insanity is, is cured. They found a, a medicine that, that fixes him by dumb luck, by Batman actually trying to make him OD on these other chemicals, fixed him. So he's going into the name of Jack Napier, and he also found the original Harley Quinn. Now this is, side note, not in this issue, side note. They explain the two different Harleys, like the one from the cartoon, and the one from the movies and the comics we have now. And what it was is, the original Harley rolled with the Joker, she realized that the Joker didn't love her. The Joker loved Batman. The Joker loved being the Joker. The Joker didn't love her. He just kept her around. So she quit and walked out on the Joker. And this total other bimbo dits took over as Harley. Like, literally like, hey, you take over so he doesn't realize anything's going on. And this other bimbo was like, ah, okay. So it's two different women. Two completely different women, the cartoon and what we have now. And I know this is not a canon, so to speak, explanation, but man, did I think that was amazing. That was awesome. I was like, perfect, that's fine. This new Harley isn't the Harley that I enjoyed. That explains they're two different people. So, back to this issue, issue number four of The White Knight. So, Jack Napier has been working with uh, a low-end, primarily uh, colored and ethnic part of the city that, that the Gotham police are known to just terrorize and be mean to. And Jack Napier goes in there and gets to know people and is friendly and is social and is a good guy and gets everybody to support him and decides that he's going to run for city council. And the actual city council people are flipping out, and Commissioner Gordon's really edgy, but Gordon being the outstanding cop he is, is like, here's lines I won't cross, I don't care if this is the Joker, I'm not going to arrest him on false charges, and city council's like, I don't care, it's politics and nonsense, and it kind of, kind of reminds me of the world today. Anyways, so they're going along with the story, and... Jack and Harley are, are running this campaign, and they go to do a march. And the police show up and are like, you don't have the papers to do this march. And Jack's like, yeah, because I submitted them, and you guys just never did anything. And that was over a week ago, so because you didn't do your job doesn't mean I'm going to stop. And they're, they're having these kind of clashes, and there's, there's two lines in, in the street. And things are getting tense, but they're not violent. And then Batman strolls in. And Batman, like, flows lines jack to the ground, starts beating the crap out of people. And Batman starts almost a riot. And that's been the theme of this, is Batman is getting blindsided. And just like, I gotta take down the bad guy. And he's not thinking about the public. And there's a $3 billion a year fund. $3 billion a year fund in Gotham to fix things Batman breaks. And Jack's like, 
instead of fix Batman or fixing the things that Batman breaks, why don't we take that money and invest it in resources to be as good as Batman? Why don't we have an entire team of our own people that have Batmobiles, that have utility belt gadgets? You know, why don't we make Batman either work with us or retire? Straight up. And Commissioner Gordon's like, you know, he will never go for this. This is a, a non-starter for Batman. And Jack's like, you're right, that is a non-starter for Batman. But not for Batgirl, and not for Nightwing. And just kind of like, it's all cocky about it. And Gordon's like, okay. So they create the GTO. Gotham Terror Oppression. And, uh, yeah. Basically, it's you as a vigilante work with the cops and become accountable to the cops or you don't get to play anymore and it's being run by the best of the best in the gotham city so rapidly they're putting batman on the outside edge to the point where batman can't be batman because the way batman operates is not working for the city so to speak so again this has been an awesome awesome book where Batman slowly turning into not the the villain, but certainly the problem. You know, he was the solution, but now he is the problem. He is what's perpetuating all this stuff to just keep happening over and over, which is the theme that they've touched on Batman a million times. But where this is different is the Joker, instead of being highly insane, is highly intelligent, is driven and focused to fix the issue, while still being the Joker, because... He's pulling shenanigans in the background. He didn't pull any in this issue, but in issues prior, he's been kind of like pulling strings on stuff and still being kind of Jokery-esque. But in the public's view, untouchable. So, again, I, I know I'm sounding like a broken record where I'm like, I can't wait to see where this is going. But this book, holy moly, this book is great. This is, this is going to be one of those... Um, if you don't want to, you know, you obviously haven't started buying it now in a lot of cases. Hardback. This will be a nice, shiny, pretty hardback you buy, put on your shelf, lend out to your friends. That's what this will be. Down the road when it's all said and done. Next we've got issue, um, issue 20 of Cyborg. This is the last issue of this comic. Um, it is written by Kevin Grievous and Cliff Richards. Alright, so the overall Cyborg comic was written by another guy primarily for like 18 of the issues, and they were okay. These last two issues, though, if the whole comic had been as good as these last two issues, it wouldn't be cancelled. Because these last two issues have been amazing. So, Cyborg goes back to a, a tiny nation in Africa, and there is a, a rhino horn that basically works like Aladdin's magic lamp, but it doesn't give you good things. It gives you uh, it gives you what you want in a cursed way. And this militia is making children make the wishes, so the curse falls upon them. An example being like they make the kid children wish for wealth, and these meteors rain from the sky, and they're full of jewels. But the curse is it rains on the village and like kills a bunch of people. Like people are now dead. Like some of these children are missing their family members and other children. But the militia got a bunch of money. And Cyborg's been there in the middle of all this. Um, kind of feeling sorry for himself. Moping about. Um, they're, they're trying to figure out how to make him human while still being a robot. It's, it's very bizarre. And there this rhino horn there and he gets it and wishes to be normal and loses his power of Cyborg. So he's just a normal ass dude. Which was a stupid thing to do in the middle of all this. And then he makes... Um, so there, there's the militia. And one of the children goes to steal a gem. Now this this screwed with me a tiny bit. They they bring this child forward to the, the leader of this militia. And the militiaman's like, you know, you steal from me, boy. And the boy's like, yeah. And pulls out the, the gem and hands it back to the guy. And the guy's like, I'm glad you told the truth. And it pulls out a gun and shoots him in the face. And I'm like, did you shot a child? I mean, like a kid. Like a damn kid in the 
face. In the face. So it was a little shocking. I wasn't I wasn't actually expecting that. But it, it definitely shows you that they're willing to handle things at an adult level and not water it down. Which I can respect and appreciate a lot. It just kind of threw me off because they don't traditionally shoot children in the damn face. So, um, a number of children get killed by this militia because of the, the curse and the way things are, are panning out as, as the issue prolongs. And Cyborg gets the Hornet back for, for another, you know, he gets it back a second time. And makes the stupidest decision possible. Wishes for all the children to come back to life. Because they're chastising him for being this, you know, whitewashed American who has no concept of how his actions hurt people and what actions going on, and they're they're just berating him, and that was his response: was wish all the children back to life. And nothing happens at first, and everybody's like, "You really are an idiot, aren't you?" Because the children come back as zombies, so that was awesome. He's like little kid zombies and like villagers, like other villagers too. That you know, everybody who's died comes back as a damn zombie. It starts attacking him, and mind you, he doesn't have his cyborg powers. So he wishes that everything goes back to the way it was. So it basically reboots all the way back to a moment in last issue. So we're in this issue, but we're in the time frame of last issue. Wibbly wobbly timey wimey, it's fine, stick up, keep up. So we go back to where he initially encounters these these militiamen and makes his, his uh, screw-ups last time. And the militiamen are like, oh no, you misunderstand. We haven't been making the children use the horn because we're scared of it. We're making the children use the horn to get the most out of it. I'm not scared of the horn. And this, this guy grabs the horn and turns into like a rock golem. Like a giant, he gets his rock golem. And Cyborg's like, Okay, well, time for me to show you a trick I recently learned. And grabs, like, a truck and, like, absorbs just a crap load of the raw material of the truck into himself and becomes, like, Hulk smash. And fights this dude down. And they end up destroying the horn. And there's, like, you know, they get this guy. Like, they kill him. But he doesn't quite die. He comes back... Just enough, like, land in the group, dirt dead. Comes back enough to shoot a bullet. And one of the villagers sacrifices herself. And the, the shaman shows up from the very beginning of this story arc. And explains out the whole, like, mystic thing of how everything panned out. And Cyborg is just bent with frustration. He's like, this is ridiculous. Like, all these extra steps, what do you... And then they have this really nice line about how, like, uh, no matter how beautiful a rose is, it still has thorns. And that's what life is. It is, it is good things, and it is bad things, and it is all things at once. So you have this entire thing where he's just getting frustrated and angry and picked on and beat down, and then at the very end they, they wrap it up with this just beautiful bit of poetry about how yeah that's that's really what life is like it can't be the best day ever every day but it also can't be the worst day ever every day like that's it's both and it's how you deal with it and that's what life is so i thought that was a really nice way to end this particular issue and then to know that they're ending the entire series on that note it worked for me. It was really cute. I, I liked it. Next on the list, we've got Justice League 36 by Priest. Just simply Priest. That's all I've listed. And Pete Woods. Um, this comic had, had Priest take over just a couple issues ago. So this is the first story arc that he's run. And um, it's been very different from the tone of flavor that Justice League was prior to this. It's taken on a much darker approach. Um, the Justice League is under public fire. 
because a nun got run through by Wonder Woman's sword in the middle of an incident in the, the beginning of the story arc. Not this issue, uh, an issue prior. And that's kind of been fueling and building. And this issue starts with a, a committee, a, a, a Congress, congressional essentially, uh, hearing, and they're, they're berating Superman as to why the Justice League should be allowed to operate the way it's been operating. And, you know, because they have now missing, you know, Wonder Woman didn't leave her sword there for evidence. She took it with her. So they're, they're accusing, you know, blocking all these charges, just all these charges. And the Justice League's like, we're the Justice League. We've been doing this for years. Like, we understand there was a mistake. We will take care of it. And the, the public's just not having it. The public and, and this congressional committee are just going ballistic over this. And the, the woman who's drilling Superman on the, on the opening pages of this immediately, I mean immediately, is killed by a copycat Batman, like, openly in the streets in the middle of the night. Like, battering the forehead, just dead. And meanwhile, there's an international incident, basically. There's submarines in Chinese waters that shouldn't be there and the Justice League goes to get involved. So very classic, you know, we gotta stop anything happening, we're gonna get in there, they get Aquaman involved because he's the king of the seas and they're doing their thing and the whole time they're like, we shouldn't be here, we shouldn't be doing this, we're in China waters. Batman is calling the shots from space and Batman, on a side note, is a jerk. Batman's a total jerk as a boss. Like, the way they handle him in this, he's just a jerk. He's still Batman. So you gotta love him. Because you know he's gonna get everything taken care of and he's gonna get everybody to the win. He's a damn jerk. And they end up causing an international incident, essentially, in this in this issue. Um, because they're not sure what's going on in this submarine and whose side it's on and what's really happening, they drag it. I mean, just like hijack the sub and drag it out to international waters only to find out that it was supposed to be there legitimately and was just having like technical malfunctions and didn't trust them because they don't have to work with the Justice League, they're not another nation. They're just a bunch of vigilantes, essentially, on a global scale. And, uh, yeah, so the Justice League just keeps digging, digging that, that hole for themselves. You're killing a nun on accident. Um, Arthur overstepping Batman and just like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do because it's in the ocean and nobody can stop me. While the other team members are like, hey man, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. And the whole issue, there's still this like, who the hell is this copycat Batman? Like, who was the guy who dressed up as Batman and killed a member of you know, politics with a batarang in the middle of the night on the streets? And one of the Green Lanterns gets set up basically as a Trojan horse to make this guy step out. And that's how this issue ends, is you find out, or he, you know, steps out as he, he dupes this, this Green Lantern. She still don't know who he is or what his agenda is, so we'll have to see where that goes. Alright, next we got Nightwing 36 by Sam Humphreys and Bernard Chang. This comic here uh, has been pretty good. It's not the, the best of the best, but it's been enjoyable. This comic literally, or this issue started literally where the last issue ended. He got shot in the shoulder. He's fallen off a bu uh, building. So he's falling through the air, shot, saves himself. Nightwing spends the entire issue trying to track down the, the current villain, Judge. And Judge has this ability to give you a golden casino chip and tell you to do something and you have to do it. Uh, it's, it's a very mind control -y, purple man kinda kinda thing. And Nightwing's going around with a shoulder wound, just beating the crap out of like all the under level bad guys, like, tell me what I wanna know, just punching faces in. Meanwhile, Judge, the actual villain, is in the mayor's office. And the mayor's like, who are you? What are you doing here? Like, calls the security. Security doesn't show up. Because this guy sent them all home. And, uh... 
he explains that, you know, you need to repent. You need to tell me what happened. And the, the mayor's like, oh my god, you know, fine. So what the mayor had done to get the casinos into Bloodhaven was he cut a deal with the federal government. And that was that 10% of the money the casinos made went to public schools. But the casinos are run by crime bosses. So they didn't want to do that and told the, the mayor no. So the mayor had been faking the books this entire time. So that way nobody knew the casinos weren't paying the money. And then the casinos start blackmailing him on top of that. So he's in pretty deep. So the mayor does a big old line of cocaine off the table and starts just confessing everything to judge. Just tells him everything about how he's he's faking the books and he's not giving the money to the schools and how he's a terrible person. And while he's doing this, Nightwing, like I said, is just beating the crap out of anyone and everybody trying to find out anything about this guy. And gets to the mayor's office just a couple seconds too late. The mayor's already been dead. Or already shot. Like, committed suicide. And judge is gone. So, there's he's still looking for judge. He goes home, and it kind of gets on with his, uh, he gets a video chat with Alfred at one point, and is like, I got a bullet. Walk me through how to take it out. And Alfred walks him through how to, like, get the bullet out and sew himself back up. And he moves on with himself and that's the the end of that i do want to call out probably one of the most adorable characters i've discovered in a while a little dude in this comic called guppy guppy is adorable um he's a bad guy but he's not really a bad guy he's just doing all of these jobs to try and get money to buy medicine to save his dad and it's like a little great white shark and a big daddy great white shark and they're they're just adorable like i don't know where they came from i don't know why all of a sudden they've entered this comic i don't have any clue to their context and i don't care guppy is adorable and i want more guppy like flat out i want guppy like this dude All right, so we've got Superman number 38, the Sons of Tomorrow crossover part four. This is written by Peter Tomasi, Patrick Gleason, and it's done by Sergio David. Butchered that name. All right, so this comic, uh, like I said, this is part of a crossover, so it's been linking through the Super Sons comic, the Superman comic, and the Teen Titans. So what essentially is going on here is the evil Tim Drake from not long ago in Detective Comics has come back already again. And with the story that Superboy on Superman's son right now, Jonathan, is going to explode. He's going to go like supernova with his emotions and powers because he can't control them and he's going to kill tons of people. And this really psychotic Tim Drake has decided he's just going to kill Superboy. And Damian Wayne, Robin is not having it, which him and Jonathan have had a relationship in their own comic, and then the Teen Titans got brought in, as I said. So they're all kind of like culminating together. Um, they're not sure what to do, because they've seen him be like ridiculously destructive, Jonathan. And Damien consistently won't let him join the Teen Titans because he swears he's not ready yet. And now this happens, so it kind of leads everybody to be like, well, well, this kid's crazy and unstable, but he's Superman's son. But he's not a superhero. He's a living bomb. And there's a lot of argument, argument and the team kind of splits up in, in different ways. And they all kind of come back together. In, in this issue, everything starts to, to come back to a focal point after everything broke out. And you get John start to, to go nuts, and he starts to explode, only this time they're out in the middle of nowhere. They're at the, they're near the Fortress of Solitude. They're like, let's go here, and it's been destroyed. And they're like, well, crap, what do we do now? And Jonathan starts to panic, and <sighs> goes all Akira on him, basically, with this, like, energy ball. Well, then, out of nowhere... Three superheroes show up that I'm sure, because as I've admitted, I don't I don't know a lot of, of DC comics, but I know 
a lot of people are missing. I know Superman, Connor Kent, and I know Bart Allen Flash. I know these are two characters, I just don't know much about them. I know Connor Kent is somebody that people have passionately been missing in some cases. And then Cassie Sandmark as Wonder Woman. So these three characters show up claiming Tim Drake is part of their team from this other timeline future, again, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey. And they're just trying to get their buddy back. They're trying to bring Tim back because he's, he's overstepped conventional wisdom, essentially, at this point. And um, they get there as Superboy's going nuts. So Superman and Connor Kent both go at Jonathan Kent to try to solve this issue. And at the last second, Tim Drake realizes that, that he's calling himself Savior, by the way. So Savior realizes that he can absorb all that energy and save everybody. So it was, it was really confusing. Like, he's there to kill him, but then everybody stops him from killing him, and the event happens just in a different way, and he ends up saving him. He ends up absorbing all that power somehow and shooting himself straight out into the time stream. And that's how it ends, with him just, like, floating in the time stream, and they don't really explain why like what happened he just and he, even like jonathan's like what happened dad and superman's like somebody made the right decision son so hopefully in the next issue and then the aftermath they'll explain what the flip flop just happened there a little bit more because all i can tell you was um the kid almost went boom he didn't go boom, and there's some characters that have not been around for a long time that people have been missing. All in all, this is a weirder issue of Superman, I think because it's part of the crossover. Um, I can't wait for it to be over and just get back to Superman, because this comic has been top-notch, and this issue was... Yeah, this crossover's man. I'm not going to hate on it or be salty, but... Meh. <laughs> All right, so that's an entire episode. That's what I'm going to try to give you guys once a week. Um, I will get better at this. Like I said, I haven't done video editing in close to 15 years. Um, I'm doing all this myself. Um, work with me. I do take constructive criticism. If you get on here and just say you suck and you should not do this, you're a troll. It's all I got. I like, I don't care. But if you have a genuine, hey, if you tried this, it would be better. Or if you were to approach it this way, I would, I'll take it. I'll listen to what you guys have to say. Other than that, um, yeah, there'll be a pull list again on Wednesday. And there'll be another episode of this in a week from today, next Friday. So thank you guys for the support. And I hope you enjoy what we got going on here. And until then, I'll see you guys next week. Bye.